uh, I went and put some gas in my truck and I'm like, man, mm-hmm. uh, there's a chance that some of our folks might be struggling with some of this, you know, what's happening in the economy. So let's make sure that they're doing OK. So, yeah, I think just taking an interest in people's lives outside of work is great for any culture. You're listening to the Building a Coaching Culture podcast. If you need to compete and win in the 21st century labor market as an employer of choice, this podcast is for you. Each week, we share leadership development, coaching, and culture development insights from leading experts who are developing world-class cultures in their own organizations. And now, here's your host, J.R. Flatter. Welcome back, everybody. I'm J.R. Flatter, and I'm your host of Building a Coaching Culture. I'm here with Lucas, my co-host. How you doing, Lucas? Yeah. Running is going well. Saw you at the end of a 10-miler the other day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lucas just going. finished his MBA, by the way. Okay, right. Oh, man. Uh, Congratulations. That's yeah. outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, just on Saturday. So he's my millennial co-host. I'm your boomer host. And we have a distinguished guest today, Khalith Wright. Has a couple of nicknames, K Wright and the Enlisted Jesus. And I want to talk about that <laughs> one before this is over because that's pretty cool. I have a special place in my heart for the Enlisted Force, having been a former staff sergeant myself. And so I'm sure that'll come up in our conversation. Yeah. I just want to remind everybody who our listeners are. So, any leader of a complex organization here in the 21st century trying to compete and win in this hyper-competitive labor market. And I know you're a CEO of a nonprofit right now. You come from a military background and recruiting is very, very important for both of those, but also for our for-profit listeners. And then building a coaching culture, because we think and love to hear your opinions as we go through, uh, coaching cultures are the leadership of the 21st century. And so uh, with that, I'll pass the floor to you, Kay Wright, and I'll let you brag about yourself a little bit. Because you have quite an impressive background. Yeah. Well, Jr. Lucas, thanks, man, for the the invite. You know, I've heard so much about uh, you, Jr. I get a lot of I get a call from Ty Simmons about once a week. You know, talking about some of the things that you guys are either working on or some of the conversations that that you've been having. And, and of course, uh, you know, I've been doing some some speaking and some other work for your company. So uh, one, I, I definitely appreciate the opportunities. And this opportunity to get to have a conversation today. Like you mentioned, I retired from the Air Force in 2020 after almost 32 years. I was the chief master sergeant or the senior enlisted guy for the entire Air Force. I transitioned right into being the CEO of a nonprofit called the Air Force Aid Society, which is a one of the four relief societies that support military service members and their families from a financial and scholarship standpoint. So I'm having a, a, a really good time doing that. Much like you, and I'm glad we're talking about coaching today, I got my coaching certification through the Sherpa Certified Coaching Program. So that's something that I really enjoy doing uh, on the side. I have a few clients here here and there. And then, you know, some board work and some advising, consulting, and a a few other things. I still get to do some speaking engagements here and there as well. So I'm having a good time, man. I tell you what, I'm, I'm really enjoying retirement. Air Force was fun. I had a good time, but with this this retirement thing, if you can call it retirement, because I do have a full time and two or three other jobs, but mm-hmm. I, I feel more relaxed. I get to play more golf. I get to smoke more cigars and, and uh, drink more bourbon with, with my friends like Todd and other folks. So, uh, Oh, my God. You just hit my top three. Um, <laughs> bourbon, cigars. <laughs> um, we're very interested in all things leadership development, all things coaching, coaching accreditation and coaching cultures. So. We're going to come back and forth on those. But I was reading your bio earlier today, and it's obvious that you excelled. You you retired at the pinnacle of your career. But one thing that really caught my eye, you were NCO of the year, like year after year. (laughs) When did you first realize you had what it took to be that kind of leader? I think it was early in my career, man. Maybe when I was a a staff sergeant, E5 for us in in the Air Force, you know, I started off pretty rough. I was a you know, I was a challenge to, I was a sorry airman, <laughs> to, to be honest, right? I didn't really have my stuff together. And after a stint in the honor guard and a little bit of mentorship, I kind of got it together. But right around the time I was a staff sergeant, I started to think Kobe hadn't joined the league yet. So I, I wouldn't say I had a mambo mentality, but now looking back <laughs> there, you know, I kind of thought like, okay, 
in order for me to progress in this in this Air Force, I got to be at the top of my game all the time. And so I just kind of became relentless in, in trying to be better as a person, as a leader. I started studying a lot of leadership. Like most young military folks, I kind of started off with John Maxwell books. And uh, I was reading a lot, studying a lot, watching a lot of movies. And then I think when I went to teach at the NCO Academy, that kind of really solidified my my interest in leadership and leadership development. So I think probably around the time as a, a young, young NCO is when I realized, you know, I, I can be somebody if I, if I really wanted to. So as government contractors, we're always like looking at, you know, what does the civilian world have that we can, you know, help the military organizations? And we don't often look at it from the other side. So what would you say from the Air Force, like culture wise, the civilian world should be paying attention to and learning about? To be honest, I I like the I like really looking at what the military can learn from a corporate corporate world. But but I guess if there's anything that the corporate side could learn from the military is is the idea of discipline and, you know, structure that military members bring, which, you know, I'll be perfectly honest, is not always. So so sometimes military structure is is counterintuitive to to success and innovation and, and some of those other things. But but if I had to say, you know, one thing that they would look at is just one thing you're going to see in the military is structure. You're going to see, you know, steady growth and, and, and whatnot. You're not necessarily going to see a lot of real innovation, a lot of things just like, wow, somebody had a great idea and we did it and we made a lot of money and made a lot of progress. Mm-hmm. So if you want to know how to improve things on a steady and my, I really consider it slow basis. <laughs> so you got to look at the, the military, but you know, other than that, and an organization, uh, all of the services in the military department in, in, in general is values based, right? So all the services have their core values that they lean on that all of the members, and I won't say all the members buy into, but, but, you know, potentially most people in their services really buy into the, the core values. So, you know, those are a few things that I think the civilian side could look at. So one of the coolest things I've ever seen was you probably, I was in the back of the room. Of course, you didn't know I was there when you all awarded the chief staff the order of the sword. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. There were probably two dozen of your peers on the stage. So tell us about that award because I, I want to lead it into a discussion of culture. Yeah. And what I saw on that stage were a bunch of warriors, but a lot of love. So toss it to you right there and uh, go with wherever you take that. Yeah. So the Order of the Sword is a kind of unique uh, award that we have in the Air Force that is is presented by the enlisted force as a whole to uh, typically to an officer, an, a non-enlisted uh, person. And it's the highest level of award achievement that the enlisted force can give to a military military officer. It's, it's pretty rare. Uh, it's typically done. Sometimes it's done you know, toward the end of uh, a general's career, but mostly it's done really at the end of, of their career. And it has to be voted upon by the senior leadership, uh, enlisted leadership of the Air Force. So it's not it's not automatic, but it's, it, it says to any general officer or any colonel or whomever we decide to give it to that, man, the enlisted folks really appreciate you and care about what you did. And along with the the thing that you saw, Jr., where we present the you know we let them know that they they get the uh, award. We also do a ceremony, a very formal kind of ceremony, a little bit based on medi- medieval times and, mm-hmm. and 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 whatnot, uh, which we'll be doing for General Goldfein, the 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 one you saw this this August down in San Antonio. It it was a it was a unanimous decision by my peers who when I presented it to them and. I think he realized that it's such a rare occasion. Many of his predecessors did not receive this 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 award, and and you know I don't have anything good or bad to say about them. It's just the leadership at the time decided that whatnot. And so I think what you saw on the stage was the level of love that I had for him as a boss, and more importantly as a as a friend. Uh, you know, we're still good friends. We're like brothers to this to this day, along with all the other admiration from my colleagues who had an opportunity, some who had worked for him in the past and all who 
you know, served under him on our kind of senior leadership council. So I, so I thought it was a, a, a great moment. It was good to see him get emotional uh, about it mm-hmm. and uh, to see how excited he was to, to be receiving that recognition. Yeah, I was in the back of the room and I'm relatively new to the Air Force, having grown up in the Marine Corps. But man, that was powerful. And in my world, the academic world, when we look at culture, we would call that an artifact. You know, you build your culture around artifacts. And so the Eagle Globe and Anchor is a Marine Corps artifact. Mm-hmm. So talk to us a little bit about that. So it was very obvious to me, because you and he were on the Q&A for quite a while before that, it was obvious to me that the entire room was full of that kind of respect and love. And, and it was obvious to everyone that you and he had a really strong bond. So you could call it enlisted to officer, executive to whatever else that you might call it. It's not blue collar because that's not a good analogy. But yeah. there is a difference in the military. But you obviously had to overcome that, that chasm if there ever was one. And he was able to do it in the reverse with the enlisted force. So talk to us about how you all created that. Yeah, you know, Jerry, it's funny. We we didn't know each other before he hired me. And it was actually even more interesting that I even got an opportunity to compete compete for the job because there was a, a chief that, you know, I think we all believed was the next chief master in the Air Force. And I had a boss at the time when I was serving in, in Europe and Africa who said, well, wait a minute, maybe you should think about K-writing. And somehow my name ended up on the on, on the list. And and so, you know, I interviewed and and we just had a really good discussion. It was it was very it was unlike any interview I'd, ha- I'd had before. He he was he really put me at ease. I didn't feel nervous at all. We were just talking about life and leadership. He did have some questions. Of course, it was an interview, but. It, it felt more like a like a discussion. We agreed on some things. We 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 disagreed on some things. We exchanged, you know, books and and a few other things. And and honestly, when I left there, I I went back and told my wife at the time, like, "Hey, man, let's get ready to move to DC. This oh wow, this is a wrap, right?" <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I wasn't that surprised when he called back and 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 said, "Hey, I want you to be the be the chief." So so we started from there, and people think that you know, because maybe they see us like you did in that one event that typically we spend all this time together, you know, the chief of staff, you know, he has a, a a whole different part of the air force that he's responsible for. I have my responsibilities that he allowed me to do. And, and so we didn't spend a whole lot of time together in the office or operationally or whatever. A great majority of our time, believe it or not, was spent on airplanes, traveling to, to places. We spent a lot of time together socially. And, and so I would go to his house. He lived on um, Fort Myer. He would come to my house on, on Andrews and, and we drink and smoke and, and kind of talk about life and how we're doing. And, you know, we would have lunch once a week in the Pentagon. And, and of course, we were in meetings and, and stuff together. But I, I think our bond really developed through friendship than the, the work stuff. You know, he respected what I was doing and, and, and he had so many other higher priorities than what I was doing. And, but, you know, our families became close. We had sleepovers, which was probably really, you know, rare for any officer enlisted and certainly for the chief and the chief of staff. But I, I just, you know, earned a tremendous amount of respect for him as a as a friend and as a colleague. And of course, as the chief of staff and as as my boss and and he was the same. And I think it was a lot of it was because we could extend beyond, you know, what was happening in the Air Force. I could give him some really frank feedback. You know, we talked a lot about race and gender and and some of the other things. And and when he didn't think I was meeting the mark, he would tell me I would do the mm. same for him. And we never got, you know, offended or or sideways. And so I think all of that played into, you know, what ultimately you and other people saw as, you know, he and I as a, you know, a really solid, excellent, I would say, leadership team. So it seems like, you know, you mentioned you kind of formed a relationship and a friendship around things that weren't necessarily you know, focused on work a hundred percent. So do you think that's like a necessary piece of like having a culture that's healthy and, you know, a positive culture is kind of like taking an interest in people's lives like that? Yeah, Lucas, I I do, man. I I think it's really important because there's something to be said about hiring the right people that are capable of doing the work, right? Whatever the work might, might be. To me, that's that's kind of a given. It doesn't mean that you always get it right, that people are always going to be good at, at their job. 
But there is something about as a teammate, as a boss, you saying to a person that works with or for you, either directly or in so many ways, you know, I care about you as a person. And that could be asking about their family. That could be, oh, your daughter's got a soccer game. What time? I'll, I'll come over and, and support you. That could be, oh, yeah, your mom is, is, is struggling. Why don't you take a few days off and, and go home and, and, and tend to that? And then following up, hey, how's your mom doing? Or, you know, whatever about me. I, I think that goes a long way, man, in, in helping people feel like, hey, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. This, the culture in this organization cares about me as a person, not just the skill set that, that I bring. You know, the challenge is not everybody can do it, right? It's not, it's not always comfortable. There's a certain part of the population, I don't know the percentage, it might be half that thinks that, hey, man, you just here to do the work. You can, all the other stuff, anybody got time for that, right? And that's, that's fine, right? Everybody has their way of dealing with things. But I think if you want to get the most out of people, you have to invest uh, a little bit in them and not just, through training and leadership development stuff, but, you know, just showing people that, that, that you care about them and their situation. I mean, just think about it in this environment we've been in for the last couple of years with the pandemic. And certainly now with, you know, I can't say we're in a recession, but with kind of how things are going, I had to check on all of our employees recently to make sure that uh, I went and put some gas in my truck and I'm like, man, Mm -hmm. uh, there's a chance that some of our folks might be struggling with some of this, you know, what's happening in the economy. So let's make sure that they, they're doing okay. But so, yeah, I, I think just taking an interest in people's lives outside of work is, is great for any culture. So those of us in the C-suite, there's a, a lot of opportunity to lose touch. I know even in an organization my size, we're about 200 people, even in a small organization like that, there's a lot of separation between me and we're a global operation, like you're, you're part of global operations. You, you currently are. How do you, A, stay connected? Now we're in a virtual environment, geographically separated and virtual. How do you stay connected? But as, as importantly, how do you keep track of how their lives really are? It's challenging, right? But I think you have to, one, use the tools that are available to us today. You know, when I was a chief master in the Air Force, I really use a lot of social media, which was which was different. You know, most of my predecessors didn't use it, didn't like it, and, and kind of still don't like it. But, you know, I use social media. I use it as a means of being able to get feedback and understand what the people are feeling and what they're going through. It, it was it was kind of, you know, different for an airman in Okinawa, Japan or in Germany or, you know, wherever to just say, hey, hey, chief, uh, this is what I'm struggling with. Or this is I think this is a good idea for us to do the uniform. And for me to be able to get it directly from them without going through the 150 stages of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, leadership and levels of layers of command and saying, wow, this is a great idea, man. Let's 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 do it. And even the ones where it wasn't such a good idea, you know, I take the time. And I, and of course, I had help. Right. I had a PA advisor and, and executives and stuff that said, hey, you got an email from an airman. Why don't you call him or email him back? And, and, and so I had people that held me accountable to. You know, what I said I was going to do was be a leader for for the people. And so I think you take advantage of the team that you have and you and and you don't necessarily have to email and call everybody back. But if you if you got directors at every level that are open to saying, you know, hey, Jr., hey, Lucas, you know, we got a, a teammate, you know, in Spain or wherever. It'd be great if you could give them a call and just tell them thanks, you know, mm. for this this program, I think. You know, just thinking through and really maybe having a chief of staff or or someone that that is kind of responsible for helping you stay connected to with people. And then on occasion, maybe just bringing some of the some of your employees of that 200 set of folks saying, hey, let's pick five or six people, bring them here to the headquarters or let's meet somewhere and have them come in and just have some open dialogue about, you know, what they're going through. All, all of those little things, I think, add up to. You know, people feeling like, yep, he's the boss and we respect him. But man, he's he's a regular guy like us and he seems to care about what what we're doing. So last week um, we were having a conversation and we were talking about, you know, if you're trying to become financially successful, you make sure you don't have credit card debt and you take care of like the easy, not necessarily easy, but more most return on investment first. So if you're in a new organization or trying to build an organization's culture, like what, what's one of those easily identifiable 
high return on investment things that you would recommend? You know, I always kind of maybe go back to, you know, doing the basics good, making sure people have the basic necessities uh, that they need to do their job. So making sure that they're properly trained, that they're actually in the right job that that fits their maybe their personality, their behavior, their, their background, because the last thing you want is to hire someone or have someone in the organization. They're struggling. And then you realize six or eight months later that they don't have Internet access or they don't have the right, you know, computer or, you know, some some of that basic stuff is missing. So, you know, I would say take care of the basic stuff. I, I would say, man, take pay off the table, right? Pay people well enough to where they don't have to worry about and be kind of concerned about if they're making enough money to make make in, ends meet. And that's not always easy, right? As a company, you have to you have to, you know, make money and, and mind your expenses and whatnot. But, you know, and then whatever other perks that 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 you might offer, whether it's, you know, insurance or rewards, you know, thing, things of that nature, you know, make sure people uh, are comfortable with 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 that. In this environment, you know, you got to think about remote work, right? I'm having this discussion in my company and and I'm on a few boards and they're all having this trying to bring people back back to work and man, you got to be able to you got to be able to pivot to what's happening in the world and in in the in the environment. My my guess is if I ask my my teammates to come back to work full time or even three days, sixty percent of them would leave. You know, that's just a, an environment that that we're in. So you know, I think you know some of the basic things that where you're going to get a higher return on investment is also recognizing what people need and and being able to quickly pivot and say, okay, here are some things that we can do to 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 meet that. I would say in general, just you know, take take care of the basics. And and you'll and you'll I think you can start seeing a, a huge return on, on on your investment. And then beyond that, right, offering opportunities for people to grow because I think that, you know not many people, whether they say it or or appear to be, not many people want to stay stagnant. And so if you have programs that allow people to get certifications like like you guys offer to become coaches to to go and improve their skill set, whether they're a CPA or an HR person or whatnot, all, all on the company dime. You know, all those things I think will be huge returns on investment, encouraging people to attend conferences that were, you know, it might not be training directly, but you'll have an opportunity to mix it up and meet and and network with some of your colleagues and establish contacts. You know, all, all those little things uh, really do matter. Speaking of the remote work thing, Apple, they just lost their chief of machine learning for AI because of the remote work thing. He made a public statement and he said, you know, my team doesn't want to go back into the office and, you know, I'm taking a stand basically. Yeah. So I noticed in the invite to the conversation today, you had an executive assistant in the CC line. Yeah. And obviously to be as successful as you are and as effective as you are, you have to do a lot of delegating. So talk to us about the mindset as you, because I know from my own experiences coming up uh, through the ranks, you kind of hesitate because you want to be in the trench shoveling because that's where you came from. So talk to us about that transformation. Yeah, I think I, I started a long time ago, JR, when maybe when I first became a chief. So this is probably 2009, 2010, when I first, you know, qualified to have help. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned pretty quickly my my style is going to be I'm going to hire somebody that I know and that I trust and and I just have to be comfortable with them having access to my email them being able to speak on 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 my behalf. Now, it hasn't always worked out. There, there have been times when it when when I I had to go back and say, "Yeah, yeah, don't don't speak for me in that way or, <laughs> you know, don't delete this email or this is not something that you need to be concerned about. But for the most part, you know, I, I, to me, it kind of centered around hiring people that I that I trust and I feel comfortable with, not only to to manage my affairs, but to be able to because the, the other the, the really the, the kicker for me is someone that could speak on my behalf. Maybe not on all things, right? Mm -hmm. But but on on certain things, I feel comfortable with my exec, my chief of staff, or whomever, you know, saying nope, this is not something he'd be he'd be interested in, or this is something that he'd really be interested in, or his stance on this is X. And so I, I do have a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues that 
haven't gotten there, you know, they're at the highest levels of the Air Force and they still do all of their own scheduling and read through all of their sort through all their emails. And man, you know, it's just too there's something too when when you're a a, a CEO or a manager at any level, there's certain work that only you can do. And if you spend mm-hmm. time doing everybody else's job, then you really miss out on the opportunity. And some of it is not just about work. You know, I spend like you, JR, I'm, I'm assuming a significant amount of time really just thinking, mm-hmm. right? Thinking through, you know, where we are now, where we should be in the future, how I should deal with certain situations. And and if I had to sort through every email, every request that <laughs> that came through, I'd be a mess, man, because because some of it, too, is just not my nature. Right. Some mm-hmm. of it is just people would they never I never get back to them because. You know, I, I recognize one of my weaknesses is I'm not a very detail oriented person. You know, I'm a broad thinker. I think, you know, kind of big. And 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 so I need people around me that get, that can manage the, the the details. And and I haven't always got it right. You know, sometimes in an attempt to hire friends or folks that I, I wanted to invest in, you know, I hired the wrong people and, and things didn't didn't turn out well. And so I'm a little bit better now at. Uh, friend or not, somebody I know or not, recognizing that you know, this is not the right person for the, for this position. But but mm-hmm. I feel very comfortable with the team I have now. The team I had when I was in the the Air Force that I can delegate certain things to them, and and then I I, I depend on them to say, hey, sometimes I want to go out and 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 do exactly what our airmen or what the people that we serve are doing. So get me out to this base or get me out on one of these calls to maybe with with my job now, Air Force Aid Society, to talk to an airman that's that's going through some financial troubles and might and might need something. And, and you know, it's kind of funny, you know, that there there's there's a little bit of a gray area between what I was doing and what I'm doing now, right? People they 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 know I'm the CEO of Air Force Aid Society, but to a lot of them I'm still, you know, K right, cheap right, whatever. Yeah, I suffer from that a little bit as well. <laughs> I skyrocketed to the rank of 04 in 22 years. And so Everybody, a lot of people that we work with still see me as Jr. Major Jr. Yeah, so I, I feel you. It's hard to be a prophet in your own backyard, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you mentioned something that I, I'd like you to expand on a little bit, if you would. Only do the things that you can do. I hear that again and again from executive leaders. So, drill down in that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, I mean, at any given time in your organization, there's a hundred things that need to be done. There's probably 70 of them that you could do that you're qualified to do. Right. Based upon your experience, your background, the education and all that. There's probably only 10 of them that only you can do. Right. That only you as a CEO can sign this or decide this or, you know, what have you. And and I think the best use of your time as as a leader is to do only the things that you can do. Everything else you should either delete, you should delegate, you give people opportunities to grow, to develop themselves. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to the work. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be interested in the results because there's benefit in saying, you know, yeah, I I could make this call or I could put this presentation together, but there's lots of value in having the COO or the chief of staff or the director of this, you know, do it send it to me. I can give him some some feedback, right? There's learning and growth uh, in that. And then you free up your time again to do the thinking, to be able to go out and spend time with the folks on, on your team, to do mentoring, to do coaching, right? The last thing you want to do is, is not have time to have a meeting with a, a fellow CEO because, you know, I'm working on somebody's appraisal or I'm working on something that really somebody else on the team, or I got to spend two hours sorting through email, figuring out, you know, what, yeah. what, where I should be going next. And so I, I believe in it, but, but not in a, not in a, Hey, I'm too good to be doing administrative work. It's, it's, it's really not that it's just, there's lots of people in, in most organizations that can be doing this work and that would benefit more from, from, from doing the work. And the more stuff you do that somebody else should be doing, the less, the less things like this that 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 we all could be doing, which is a service in in and of itself to the people who will be listening and maybe gleaning some some information from this discussion. Thanks for that. Let me put my professor hat on for one second. So, in academia, we'd call that opportunity cost, and it's yeah. what are you doing 
versus what you could or should be doing. And so for you in the C-suite, you should be building and sustaining relationships with other human beings. And let me and Lucas do the email and the timekeeping and all those things. So yeah. thanks for that. And, you know, the, the challenge is, right, every now and then, and my, my teammate, Nakisha, she'll get on me because every now and then, you know, I'll, I might just be up late or, or something and I'll see an email and then I'll just respond to her real quick. And she'll <laughs> and she'll say, wait, hey, stay out of there. I already responded to that. And, <laughs> you're messing up my flow. I'm like, yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> so we talk a lot about recruiting and you mentioned it a couple of times and kind of the idea that, you know, you're looking for a certain set of skills, but it also has to be a good match. How do you balance that? And how do you know when it's a good match? Some of it, I, I think, Lucas, is maybe just, you know, my experience over the years and, and making some some mistakes. I, I made a mistake once. I had I hired someone. I had been watching them from afar. They were really, really good at what they were doing out in the field. And I thought, yep, this is the type of person that I need to run my front office. And so I hired him and man, it was a little bit short of a disaster. Right? <laughs> and, and so I had to learn that this is almost that Peter principle, right? It was sometimes you, you promote people to their level of incompetence mm-hmm. just because you're a good aviator or a good mm-hmm logistician, I, you think you could take that same skill set and park it into an administrative position, which then it, it didn't always, always fit. And so now, you know, I try to look for, yeah, you might be good at your job, but what are the other things? What, first of all, what do I need? in you know, I'm going to hire a chief of staff. What do I need in a chief of staff? What kind of skills do I need? And then I try to find someone that matches that, you know, that, that skill set. And, and I tell you a lot these days and certainly over the last few years, man, I really hire for character these days. You know, I could get the skill set right, but I'm really mostly looking at, you know, a person of character and, and someone that I think will represent the organization well, that will fit in with, you know, our team and our and our culture that cares about people like I do and, and, and whatnot. And and if I need them to learn a certain skill, I, I'm, I'm willing to take because because part of the the character that I'm looking for is someone that has a learning mindset, right, and likes to be challenged, and 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 so even if they don't, you know, necessarily have the skill that I'm looking for, I feel like if I bring this person in, I could get them trained up to to do, you know, whatever this this task. You know, I'm I'm not dealing with rocket scientists and <laughs> or mathematicians, right? We you know we're doing basic stuff, taking care of humans, <laughs> and a little bit of admi- administrative work, so. So I really do like hiring, you know, people of, of, of character that I think will be good for the organization and the people that we serve. So a lot's been going on in your life in the last five years. One of the things that we do is work with transitioning senior leaders like yourself. If you look back five years, what advice would you give to yourself knowing what you know now? I think I would have got out earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, it's nice out here, right? Here. <laughs> I think the the maybe the advice I would have given to myself is you can never start preparing too early. You can never start building the connections and relationships that might be meaningful to you on the outside, not just from a financial perspective, but, you know, in so many, so many ways, I think preparation, man, is, is really the key. And a lot of it, I think, JR, which is, and I know this from a lot of my friends that for whatever reason, I didn't struggle with transition. Some of it was, you know, man, when you're the chief master of the Air Force, you got all kinds of people helping, you got all kinds of opportunities, you got, you know, so, so to just to be frank, it wasn't that hard of a transition for me. But I do understand some of my fellow chiefs, some of my colleagues, they had a they had a more difficult time transitioning because you kind of go from being this to okay, now you're just a regular guy on the street trying to find a find a job, and and you know you were in the in the in the military and you deal with this now in the military E nine man, you're a god. Civilian companies don't really understand what that means, right? Because they don't really have that equivalent position in most organizations. They know what a colonel is. They know what a general is. They know what a sergeant major is mostly from from TV, but they still kind of unsure, especially when they read our kind of job description and resumes like, okay, kind of did what? And so, you know, you don't necessarily get out and have that that same opportunity. You're not going to have a parking space and all the 
<laughs> the stuff that you had when you were you were in. And so so some of some people have a difficult time uh, transitioning. And a lot of it is because some of this is fear, but a lot of it is they just wait too long to start building connections and relationships and understanding what life is like on the on the on the outside. And so, you know, I would say start early. Don't wait, you know, until your last year to, to go to taps or to start. You know, you should, man, I had a resume because I got mad one time. I was at 17 years and I got mad about not getting promoted. And I'm like, I'm getting out. And I, mm. I, I put a resume together, you know, 13, 15 years ago and was just, I was just updated on a pretty regular basis. But, you know, I know friends and colleagues that they're about to transition in a year or two and they don't have a resume, you know, right now mm-hmm. they don't have a LinkedIn profile. Mm-hmm. So I, I can't just say enough about preparation and building the right networking connections that, that might help you in your, in your transition. And then, you know, I preparing really mentally, cause you know, when, when you've been in as long as some of us have, dude, there's always a challenge. There's always something to fix. There's mm-hmm. always some airman that needs help. There's always something to be done. And you get out and you're like, okay, I've done all the projects around the house. I, and you miss that rush of having something to do, having somebody call you on the phone, having somebody depend on you to, to solve some problem. And, and that that's a, that's a real challenge for some people. If I could follow up real quick, talk to me about the, the loyalty. Obviously we come from a service background, not just a military service, but service minded. Like you've said, you can't start too early, what I hear from a lot of transitioning senior leaders, I can't be loyal to two, two masters. And so I'm disloyal to my service if I'm taking care of myself. Talk to me about that a little bit. Well, excuse my French, man, but I just think that's bullshit, right? <laughs> um, I think you have a responsibility to yourself, even to your your organization, to your family at some point. And most of us can do more than one thing. We can walk and chew bubblegum, right? And so me deciding at five years out that, okay, I need to get this certification, this education. I need to go to this conference. I need to start thinking about my future. I don't think in any way disturbs or, or makes me disloyal to the organization and the work that I'm, that I'm doing for the organization. A a little bit of calendar management will, you know, allow you to say, yep, I got it. I got it manage this exercise, but I'm going to take two days and go to this, this conference, or I'm going to take, you know, a couple of years and work on this MBA, right? Like, like Lucas. And so I, you know, I hate to say it, but it sounds a little bit like a cop out. Mm. Again, I know there's some fear of the unknown. Many people say, well, I don't, all I know is the military because it's all I did my adult life. Yeah. Join the club. It's all (laughs) most military people did all our adult life. But most of us, you transition in your late 30s, somewhere in your 40s, and maybe in your early 50s, right? And you may, you got a lot of life left to live and you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your family. And to that same point, right? Let's let's just say, you know, you want to be loyal to your organization. And so you decide, yep, I'm not going to do any of this stuff. I'm not going to try to take care of myself. And then in your last year, you realize, okay, shit, I got to get out. And then you start having anxiety and you start like, scrambling at the last minute and you, you're no good to anybody, Mm -hmm. (laughs) your organization, Mm -hmm. your family, or even yourself now, because you find yourself in this mode where, you know, you're so, you're so nervous and you have so much anxiety about transition. So I understand it. I I, I don't necessarily agree with that concept of, you know, having to serve, serve two masters. I think we do it all the time, right? And you're in in the military, you have to take care of your family and you have to be a good soldier, sailor, marine, coast guardsman, a guardian, whatnot. It is 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 something that, as human beings, I think we have a responsibility to 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 do to be able to manage more than one thing. Yeah, I'm I'm very quickly approaching being retired as long as I was on active duty. So that's wow. it happened in a blink. You know, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. All right, Luca, as is our tradition, you get the last question. All right. So yeah, the first thing I saw. Um, when you came on camera was Kobe Bryant behind you and you mentioned the Mambo mentality and everything. So first of all, um, I think we take it for granted that like everybody knows who these, you know, famous players are like my wife's Colombian and she has no idea who (laughs) Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or anybody are. Um, So, but anyways, um, what have you learned from, you know, sports in general or Kobe Bryant specifically? 
Yeah. So I, you know, I grew up, I won't say like many folks, because I won't assume that everybody was a sports fan, but I grew up a, a sports fan, both football and basketball and played a lot of basketball. As a matter of fact, we used to beat up on the Marines in, uh, in Okinawa. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at, uh, Cherry Point and, and out there in the coast of North Carolina too, but but anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I grew up, you know, watching watching these guys, and at you know maybe when I was younger, I sports icons, right? I know nothing about their lives or work ethic or anything. It wasn't until I got older and started maybe reading books and seeing documentaries and stuff on Michael Jordan, and Tiger Woods, and Muhammad Ali has always been a, a huge, you know, kind of hero of mine. But I took to Kobe when he first came into the league initially, just because of his skill set. I like the fact that. He was a bit of a rebel. He didn't really care what people thought about him. And, you know, he was going to be successful regardless. And then when I started learning kind of about his work ethic, how he was always in the gym, how he's always working on his game. He he actually helped me something that he does helped me a lot. So as a speaker, I would never go back and watch my stuff and critique myself and and see how good or bad I was. And then I, I I saw him talking one time, you know, every game he goes back and watches every second of every mm-hmm. game and analyzes how he did and what he could do better. And, you know, I, I used to think, well, shit, it's done now. Everybody seemed to like it. So I, you know, why would I waste time going back mm-hmm. looking at, listening to myself talking? But now I do just based on his mentality of always getting better, even if it's just one thing. And so I go back and if the tape or whatever is available and I look it's like, OK, yeah, that pause was too long. Oh, man, I, I was repetitive there. Too many us or ums. OK, let me just make a note. And so, I, you know, I, I, I learned certain things. I learned, you know, I like the way that that he drove and pushed his his teammates. I'm not I don't have that same kind of, you know, hey. You better, you better get to it. I have a, a kind of a different approach, but I, but I kind of appreciate it that in the environment that he was in, you know, he didn't mess around. I'm, I'm totally different from him in that I love hanging out with my teammates and, and, and having a good time. I know he was a bit of an isolationist. He got better toward the end of his career, but, uh, you know, I learned, I learned quite a few things from, from, from him, from Tiger Woods and, and of course, from Muhammad Ali, like I, I said, mostly from Muhammad Ali, man, I, I love that he stood up for what he believed was right and he was willing to sacrifice his title at the time for, you know, again, standing up for something that he believed was the right thing to do. Hmm. Well, thanks a lot, man. This was incredible. Yeah. Um, anything we can do for you? Any questions you have for us? No, man. Like I said, I, I just appreciate uh, this opportunity. Definitely appreciate the opportunity that I get to, you know, to partner and 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 work with with you and, and the Speakers Bureau and some of the some of the other things that that you've been doing, I, I love the fact that this is the first time I've ever seen the level of enlisted leaders be involved in a company like yours, and and I love to see all of the folks, you know, of course, headed up by Old Loud Mouth Pat. Well, that concludes this episode of Building a Coaching Culture. I truly hope that this episode was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe stop and give us a rating or a review and share this podcast with someone who might find it helpful as well. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.